Hi, I'm Paul Merriman, and uh, we are in for a treat today because uh, joining me uh, is going to be uh, Chris Pedersen, who is the Director of Research at our foundation, and uh, Daryl Balls, who is the uh, Director of Analytics with our foundation. And we are here to talk about the questions that were posed to us at an AAII, American Association of Individual Investors chapter meeting in San Diego on May 9th. And uh, while we answered a lot of questions there, we also promised that those we didn't get to, we would get to. So we're doing it now, and uh, we've got a lot of them. So hang on, and I hope these will uh, apply in many cases to a, a situation that's uh, on your mind. So let me just uh, start running through these questions. I'm going to start here with number one. How do the long-term returns for small and large cap growth compare to the returns for small and large cap value? Now, here's why this question is being asked. If you sat through our presentation, you would note that we talk about small and large cap value, and we talk about small and large cap blend, which is a combination of both growth and value. But what about growth all on its own? So I just took a few minutes, went back and looked at some past data going back, I could go back to 1979. And the reason I go back to 1979 is that I can look at the Russell indexes, both the large cap and the small cap, and the blend. And let me give you the Russell returns for these different asset classes from 79 to 2019. The small cap blend, remember, growth and value, compounded at 11.4% over that period of time. The small cap growth, and you're going to be surprised by this, I think. 9.8 is a substantially lower number. So a small cap value was 12.6. So there's a case where small cap value uh, did way better. By the way, that would be the kind of uh, advantage, according to the academics that have looked at this stuff all the way back to 1926, 27, 28. And, um, and, and so that the blend was kind of halfway in between the small cap growth and the small cap value. When we go to the Russell large cap blend, that was a 12% compound rate of return. The large cap growth was 11.6 and the large cap value was 12. Interesting. It was interesting. There was in the large cap value, looking at the, uh, uh, at the uh, at the Russells, there wasn't much difference between the growth or the value or the blend. By the way, the S and P 500 over that period of time also made 12, as did the total market index. Now, I want you to see something really interesting because when we think about I index returns, we think, well, they're probably similar. No, it depends on how they put the index together. So at DFA, and that's the place that Chris has been working to try to replicate the DFA work, and here you're going to find out why, in putting together the best-in-class uh, ETFs. Because here's over that same period, using the way that DFA puts together the different asset classes, the small cap growth, according to DFA, was 13.2. That's versus 9.8 for the Russell uh, small cap growth. Uh, small cap value was 15.6, and small cap blend was 13.8. Big advantage to the way they constructed the DFA asset classes. The, um, the difference in the large cap blend versus large cap growth and large cap value, uh, the blend was 12, the growth was 12.8, and the value was 13.6. So indexes are not all created equal. And so it's important to understand the differences in how they create an index 
And then it's important to understand how they try to manage that index because some are easier to manage than others. And I don't know, do you guys want to add anything to that? Never. I, I, did, uh, I did just a little bit of research on this question too. I went to Portfolio Visualizer and looked back at some measures of the return per unit of risk. So specifically the Sharpe ratio and the Sortino ratios. Mm -hmm. And um, they basically, I think they confirm what you just said, but the, they showed that the small cap value had the best return per unit of risk, the large cap value, the next best, the large cap growth, the next best, and small cap growth, the worst. So I, you know, I think uh, we're always trying to give investors the best return per unit of, uh, of risk. And um, that's part of the reason we favor blend instead of growth. Right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, number two, how do required minimum deposit distributions, required minimum distributions fit into your distribution assumptions. Now, Daryl, I'm going to give this to you in just one second, but I'm also going to okay. say that we're going to put a link. We're going to put a link to the page on distributions because there's a lot of stuff you can dig into if you're interested in maximizing your distributions. But, but how do RMDs fit into that study? Well, the short answer is they don't at all, at least not directly. Uh, the distribution tables are, are based on what you what you can take from your portfolio or what you need to take from your portfolio. The 4% distribution assumes you start out at 4% and then ratchet it up with inflation. It's typical of the, of the sustainable withdrawal studies. So that's, that's what the distribution tables are based on. No RMDs. Um, if your RMD happens to be smaller than what the distribution table says you need to take or you can take, um, then, then you can uh, you need to take more than what the RMD says. If your RMD is larger than what you need uh, from the distribution table, then you can put it in your taxable account or or wherever you need to put those kind of things. Uh, so I think that's I think that's really the the bottom line from the distribution tables. They're not they're not tied to the RMDs at all. Okay, great. Uh, number three, am I right to assume? that the ultimate buy and hold and four fund strategies can be used at any age. All right. Fire away, Chris. You, oh, okay. you, you, you're the developer of the, of, of, uh, well, of the two fund strategy, excuse me, but, but go ahead and, and make a comment on the, on the, uh, well, it, sure, certainly. Um, yeah, the ultimate buy and hold and four fund strategies are equity strategies. So I would expect that somebody at different ages is going to make a choice that's appropriate for their age and all of their other circumstances between equities and fixed income to control their risk. Mm -hmm. So whether the equity part of your portfolio is a target date fund, which includes some fixed income, right? So then you're going to have to offset that by maybe a little more equity in the other part. Um, or a four fund strategy or an ultimate buy and hold, um, you've still got to work out what the right risk is for you. And that's going to um, then have implications in terms of how much fixed income you carry, right? So Daryl, did you have thoughts on this one? Well, yeah, I think, I think any of Paul's strategies, equity strategies are applicable at any age. It depends on, your, on the risk that you want your overall portfolio to have. Um, I did a little a little back background here. If I can share this one screen, if I can figure out how to do it, there we, we got go. it. Okay, where am where am I here? That one. Um, so I looked at I guess six different portfolios: the S and P, the Ultimate Buy and Hold, the Four Fund Combo, the Trev H Four Fund, the All Value, and the All Small and Small Cap Value. And so if you pick a, a S and P 500 60 40 as your baseline. Uh, that has a 9.4% annual return and a 10.8 standard deviation and a minus 31.6 uh, drawdown, max drawdown, over the period that we looked at, 1970 to 2019. You want to tell us what the drawdown is? What, what, what's the definition? That's how far down the market went from, uh, from a peak during a bear market. And I don't recall exactly when this was. Mm -hmm. um, for the 60-40 portfolios, probably probably 2008 would be my guess, but I don't know. 
Um, so if you if that's kind of your baseline, then you can adjust your your asset allocation for these other portfolios to come up with either the same standard deviation or the same drawdown. And that's what I've done here in this blue row on either one of these. So the the asset allocation percentages are a bit too precise to be real, right? Okay, but the point is you can adjust the asset allocation to get to match the same risk in terms of standard deviation or drawdown uh, for any of those uh, portfolios. So, so, th so the, what is the, in, in terms of the return uh, difference here, it looks like the it's small cap value. About eight, it's about eight tenths, anywhere from eight tenths to up 1% or so. Interesting. So Good if you, work. if you did, if you wanted to have an all small cap value equity portfolio, then you only need to have 45% of your assets in equities. 55% in fixed income. That gives you a 10.8% standard deviation and a 10.5% return per annum annualized. Uh, that's so how Darryl, to read that table. So yeah, Daryl, one of the things I really like about this chart is that it, it drives home the fact that once you've decided to diversify by incorporating a you know some tilt towards small and some tilt towards value, that you get very similar results for the same amount of risk, whether you've got the 10 fund, the four fund, the four fund international, you know, the, the, if, if you tune it for the same drawdown, you get about the same return and the same risk, which is kind of interesting because people really agonize over, well, which of these is the right one for me, right? You know, which is the perfect one. And this shows that, uh, they, you know, when you tune them for the same amount of risk, the same amount of drawdown, you can mm -hmm. get to the same place with an all small cap value and all value of four fund solution, the Trev H, the ultimate buy and hold. They all, they all kind of get you to the same destination, which is really interesting. Yeah, but, you can. And, and, the, and it kind of, the one that's right for you is the one that you can stick with. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Perfect. But well, is there any question then, if one is looking for the best unit of return per unit of risk, given these numbers, then which one would you recommend they use, assuming that whatever you recommend, they will stay the course? Well, that, that's a good point. I don't know. I didn't look at the Sortinos, for example, which is the okay. one that I would kind of, kind of gravitate towards picking. You know, that it gives you the, if these, if these all have the same standard deviation, same drawdown, um, and and then you can look at what the returns are, what you and the and the, the Sortino ratio. Um, that'll give you the one the one that in theory gives you the best return for the amount of risk you're taking. Now, in, in theory, these are all pretty close to the same risk, mm -hmm. so the one that would give you the best return would be all small cap value. Mm -hmm. You know, I if you have the, if you can do that. Yeah. I'm going to resonate with something you said earlier, though, Daryl. I think the behavioral aspects of it trump the minor differences. I agree. Right. So, you know, to to be somebody who invests in in just small cap value and fixed income, you have to have incredible tolerance for that asset class to underperform for a large number of years to stay yep. the course. Right. And we'll talk Where about that later. <laughs> right. But in but in contrast, if you're in a four fund solution. Or, or the uh, internationally diversified four fund, the Trav H model, you know, you've got a higher likelihood that one of those assets is is doing really well when one of the other ones is out of favor, and so it's a little bit easier, I think, to stay the course, right? And right. with the ten fund, you're always in a winner, right? With the ten fund, you you've always got a winner. So I, I think the behavioral aspects are probably way more important at, you know, at that point in the choice than trying to pick the one that's got just a slightly better Sortino ratio. Right. Uh, it, it, yeah. it depends on how well you can deal with the ups and downs and, and the, and the mismatched yeah. performance or the, or the tracking error, if you want to call it that. It also depends on the amount of effort it takes to maintain the portfolio too. Yep. Depends but the on bottom the line set. is, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Okay. The bottom line is, is that if I use the 10 fund solution, I'm at the least risk of one really bad performing asset class sinking the ship. And, and so that is the advantage of having a whole bunch of different, uh, 
That's good. That's good, Daryl. Thank you very much. Um, number four. Oh, I love this one. This is this is a fascinating stra uh, struggle for people. How does a person pick funds in their 401k plan? Now, we have spent years, and admittedly, we dropped out of that process in the last year, deciding that we just didn't have the person power to continue to maintain updating all of the 401k plans that we've analyzed in the past. We're, we haven't given up on that, but we have been on hold with that. But what we did for years was look at individual 401k plans and using what we'd learned about the, the 10 fund strategy, the ultimate buy and hold, try to build a portfolio that, that replicates what you have in that 10 fund strategy. It was easy with IBM because at IBM they allowed people to go to the self-directed part of the IBM offerings and they had all 10 of those asset classes there. But most, most 401k plans do not. For example, Chris, when you were working at your, at your last job, how good were the choices? How many of the 10 in the ultimate buy and hold do you think that you could get to? You know, that's hard for me to remember at this point, just because uh, I've been retired a while and I didn't get exposed to your work until the very uh, end of my career. So I can't answer specifically for there, but um, I think you and I both had, you've done a lot more of this than I have, but I think you had some basic rules that you applied um, so, you know, you looked for low cost funds and, uh, you know, for example, if, if there was a small cap blend and a large cap value, but no small cap value, I think what you would do is you, instead of putting 10 in each of those, you'd put 15 in each of those, right? So that you would, uh, keep the total that was in value and small, um, the same, right? So you kind of, you, you do a little bit of substitution, um, what, what else did you do when you were going through all these imperfect collections? Cause that's what it was, right? You always well, have an imperfect course it, selection. It is imperfect and it gets very difficult when they only have one international fund and it's a large cap blend. And you know that that is probably going to be the least productive international asset class they could be in. So even though I might want to be 50-50 U.S. international, do I want to be 50% in international if all I get access to is the least productive among them? And so uh, that's a challenge. And, and very few plans had a small cap value. In fact, Daryl, at Boeing, I don't think you had a small cap value, did you? Not that I recall. I think the the smallest thing that we, there might've been a small company's portfolio, but I think it was actively managed. There was a Russell 2000 index, uh, which is about as small as they got, I think. So, so it is, it's hard to get everything that we would like. And if I could sit down with somebody one by one, I could say, okay, what do you got in your 401k? And is your 401k the best opportunity assuming you don't have access to all these asset classes, would there be conditions under which you would look to an IRA to be able to get at these other asset classes? So it's really a, a complex process to try to do this kind of for everyone. But I promise, and I'm not always kept my promises time-wise, but this is something we're going to attack this year. We have the brains here to be able to figure out what would be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for that with the step-by-step, -step, there's a word I'm looking for. You guys don't know it either, okay. Oh, like a heuristic or an algorithm? You yeah, know, an kind algorithm, of a, here's a, the word. Yeah. Yes, an algorithm that would take into consideration all of those problems you have in trying to emulate something that you think would be better. So it's a challenge. And Daryl, would you add anything to that? Because you had to, you lived with that problem. Yeah. What we, what we did was we managed our, 
our 401k as part of the overall portfolio. So it was a little bit like you suggested. If, if we looked at what we had in the 401k and then, and then and compare that to what we could get on the outside and, and we had to invest a certain amount, we had to invest whatever we had in the 401k in something. So we looked at what the, the best or the least worst options were in the 401k, did that first and then filled in either in the Roth or the, or the Tira or the taxable, depending on, on how it worked out. So we managed the portfolio as a whole. Okay, great. Thank you, gentlemen. We will talk more about this in the future. Uh, I to the ultimate buy and hold strategy. Should I sell everything and just start over or dollar cost average in over time? Uh, is, what do you think, Daryl? Well, I think it depends on where your investments are located. Uh, if you're if you're located in a tax deferred or tax free account, uh, those you can you can buy and sell with impunity, really, um, to get wherever you want to go, uh, and and fill in at, with, with uh, your other accounts as as necessary. If you have most of your investments in a taxable account. Uh, I think you have to look pretty pretty carefully at what the tax implications could be for massive selling. If you have losers in there or things that don't have very much, uh, very many capital, very much capital gains associated with them, um, those might be candidates for repositioning. Uh, otherwise, uh, your your suggestion of maybe moving in as the money becomes available uh, through your paychecks um, is is a good idea. I think to shift shift your allocation that way as, as best you can. Uh, it's a complex problem. What I ran into often was a uh, people who were rolling out of their retirement plan at work and they were going to an IRA. And so let's say they were 60, 40, 60 equity, 40 fixed income. And as they made that move over to the IRA, now they're, they're managing themselves or somebody else's. But the question is, should I just move that money over to the, to the equity or should I dollar cost average in? Well, in that case, I always felt that somebody you did or somebody helped you decide that you had the risk tolerance for 60, 40, and that you should just maintain that and put it over into the IRA and keep it at 60-40, no dollar cost averaging necessary. On the other hand, I will say that when people have inherited uh, a large amount of money and now it's time to put that into the market, very often it turned out that what was most possibly going to be emotionally doable would be the dollar cost average in, sometimes over a very relatively short period of time and sometimes over a couple of years. So Chris, would you add anything to that? I would just, I would agree. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the dollar cost averaging smooths, smooths things and uh, gets you away from the possibility or, or reduces the possibility of regret, which we all don't like, right? We all try to avoid regret, but it gets you going at the same time. And then I totally agree with uh, Daryl's comments that you got to think about the taxes. Yep. Yeah. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, number six, I want to use the two funds for life, but I'm 62 and not sure it will have much impact. All right, Chris, this is your baby. What do you suggest? Well, this one's, this one's hard because I, I, can't, I can't say anything about what impact it'll have without knowing what you're starting with, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, uh, you know, if you're starting with something that looks like the two funds for life in terms of its total allocation, and you're just switching to make life easy from a management standpoint, it'll have little change on your volatility or your return or the risk, um, but it'll simplify your life, which could be a good thing. And if everything's in tax deferred accounts, great, go for it. But, um, but without knowing more, it's hard to say. So um, I guess my, my comment back to this would, this person would be, look at what your current fixed income and equity allocation is 
and then look at what it would be if you switched to the two funds for life and see if that's a big change, right? If it's, if it's a big change, um, then that suggests that it might make a difference, but you don't have many years, right? The two fund for life ramps you down to all target date fund around retirement. And if you're 62 years old, that's not very long. So even if the allocation is really different for a couple of years, the expected return is probably not going to be very different. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it, it's hard to answer, but I, I would say in this case, um, you know, it's probably not going to make a very big difference. And the more important thing is going to be, what do you want to manage? What do you want to live with? Yeah. So, but, but without knowing more, it's hard to say any more than that. But you did uh, at that AAII uh, get together, uh, you did address two funds for life after retirement. And it I, took, it took investors beyond just small cap value and, and, and a target date fund. And so my hope is, is that people who want to dig deeper into that topic will watch that presentation because it comes with slides and, and uh, I think it's about 40, 50, 45 minutes long. I'll make sure we have a, a link to that uh, for, for our, our listeners. I, it also, if, if the person is just a little bit technical and inclined to do some exploration on their own, it also gives them a how-to for how they could analyze what they would expect at PortfolioVisualizer.com using a two-fund approach into retirement. And if for people who have the patience to do that, I think it will give them added confidence that things are going to work out and added understanding of how much risk they're taking. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, going and looking at that presentation should help. Thanks, Paul. Does that mean that you have confidence in the future based on what you've seen in the past, even though I, nobody seems to know what's going to happen next? Yeah. I mean, nobody, I, I have very little confidence in anybody's ability to predict day-to-day -day fluctuations yeah. in the market, but I have to, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like climate versus weather, right? I, I, I'll second guess the weather forecast one day out, especially in the mountains where my, where my daughter lives in Colorado, because the weather will change every, every hour. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't second guess the climate, right? I'm pretty confident they're going to have thunder showers in the summer and it's going to be cold and snow in the winter, right? I mean, that, that part's pretty stable. And I think that we do the same thing when we're trying to make a decision about our future investments. We're looking more for the climate than the weather. And the best predictor of the future is the past. And it's not a perfect predictor, but... Um, yeah, I think equities are going to outperform fixed income over the long haul because um, all of the history suggests that that they have and will, right? So, so we we try to yeah we try to make good decisions about the future based on the past, but there are no guarantees, right? What about since you're going to use climate versus weather, where do you factor in the 100 year storm? Yeah, I mean, that that happens, right? The Great Depression is a 100-year storm. Um, maybe what we're going through with coronavirus is a 100-year storm. Those things happen. But um, in the same way that societies come back after a storm, it takes time to rebuild. The economy and the stock market tends to come back after after it goes through its 100-year gyrations, too. So um, I think the, the real trick in both cases, right, in weathering a storm or in uh, weathering a stock market equivalent storm is being prepared and being patient, right, to, to ride. So you want to you wanna board up. You want to have the right amount of fixed income for protection. And then you don't want to panic sell when the market's down, right? You want to figure out how to get to the other side. So... Yeah, I think the analogy holds holds up pretty well. And Daryl, did you want to add anything? No, I think you guys covered it pretty okay. well. All right, great. Um, number seven, instead of a Vanguard target date fund, what about a mix of total U.S. stock index, he says, or she, in ETF, international stock index, 
an international bond index and a U.S. bond index. Then they ask, is that too conservative? And uh, so what do, you, what do you say, guys? Do you build your own or do you, you, you go with what they build for you? Chris, you want to take it first? Sure. I mean, if you're going to go with a do, do it yourself combination like that, the only advantage, and we spoke to this last time, is that you might be able to get a slight edge on the expense ratio. You might be able to, to get, uh, I think we came up with up to, uh, up to uh, a tenth of a percent or more, right? So is that worth it to you to do it on your own? Maybe. It, it doesn't have any of the smaller value tilts that our portfolios recommend. Mm -hmm. um, and you're still going to have to manage your fixed income uh, equity risk over time. You're going to have to manage your glide path, right? So uh, it's more conservative in a sense than what we recommend, but it's also less return per unit of risk than what we re recommend based on history because you're not getting any uh, any exposure to the smaller value tilts by doing it that way. Yeah. Gerald, thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'd like to share this thing again if I can here and see what happens. Okay. So I looked at four of the target retirement funds and then their target retirement income fund. Can you guys see this? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. So the first thing I would say is the Vanguard target retirement, target date retirement funds are made up of the U.S. total market, the international total market, the U.S. total bond market, the international total bond market. So they are made up of those funds that the questioner was, was interested in. It's just how they mix them. And, uh, and so if you, if you look at the target retirement 2030, it's almost 70% equity by the time you get to the retirement date. 2015, it's 36%. And by the time you move into the target retirement income fund, it's 30%. So you can pick which one you want as in terms of aggressiveness in a target date fund. In fact, that's typically how I would suggest to folks to pick them. If you don't know anything else, pick it by your date. But if you feel you want to be riskier, pick one that's a little further out and it'll give you a higher equity allocation. Um, the other thing, uh, the thing about retirement, uh, target retirement funds, like, like Chris mentioned, is they do, con they continuously rebalance and they follow a glide path. Okay. You don't have to deal with it. If that's what you want, fine. If you don't want to follow a glide path, then you can do it yourself. If you don't want to rebalance the way they rebalance, you can do it yourself. Um, in that case, those four funds are fine. But I also agree with what Chris said. And that's that it doesn't always allow you to tweak your, your sub asset allocation if you want. If you want to tilt one way or the other, then the target retirement date fund is not the right way to do it. At least not without something like the two funds for life on top. That's great. I, I read a, a part of a new study on target date funds. And I, I'll tell you, I am very excited to share this with young people. Uh, who have a lot of time on their side, because according to the study, and this was done by Wharton, probably financed by Vanguard, I suspect, as they had some part in the process, but they showed over a, uh, an extended period of time, which included the terrible bear market of 2008 and 9, uh, they showed the, they were able to open up retirement accounts, those that use target date funds, and those that did it on their own. Now, it did it on their own is a wide spectrum of potential solutions. And by the way, some of those solutions will be way too little equity for somebody who's very young. Now, we, we believe that. It doesn't mean that they believe that. But here's the bottom line, is that the target date funds produced 2.3% more per year in return compared to the people who did it on their own. Now, again, did it on their own could be a whole bunch of equity or no equity at all. But 2.3% is a big deal, remembering that averages come from numbers that are worse than that. 
uh, in terms of underperformance. And so my, my gut is, is that for 90 plus percent of investors, particularly young investors who don't have much experience, that the, the idea of using the target date fund is just number one on my list. Of course, we would love to see them even put 10% in small cap value, but without the small cap value, you've got a huge advantage. And, and I got I was gonna share it, but I'm, I can't share it because I, I don't have it set up to share it, but Daryl, you produced a table here recently for me that showed if I could make a half a percent better over my lifetime of investing and my lifetime of distributions in retirement, how much difference it would have on my life and those who survived me if I could just figure out where to get an extra one half of 1%. And this, this assumed that $5,000 a year was going into an investment that made 5,000, I'm sorry, that made 8% and then somebody else got eight and a half percent. And the person who got 8%, when they got to retirement, they had about 2.3 million. The people that made eight and a half, they got about 2.7 million. Not a huge difference. But by the time you took that out, out over the level of the, the period of distributions and then leaving what you left to your, your, your children in charities, the difference is, uh, and I can see it's about to come up. There it is. There it is. Scroll up a little bit more. I'd like to see the bottom. Yeah, there it is. The bottom line difference in return for that lousy half a percent is $2.3 million on an investment of $230,000 over a 46-year period. And that is what we're fighting for for young people that – if we can find a half a percent for an investor, we have done something. I don't mean we, the market makes you that money. Chris and Daryl, we can't make you that money. We can just encourage you to do the things that we believe will get you that extra return. But what if it's 2%? That is truly, truly a life change. That's earlier retirement. That's leaving or having way more in retirement to spend than you thought you were going to. So uh, it's a great study and we will have a link to that study. Okay, number um, eight. This one is going to be for you, Daryl. What are your thoughts on an all value portfolio that is one third each large cap value? small cap value and international value. And they don't say whether they want large or small international value. So, you know, there are a million ways we can construct these things. We have a strategy that is constructed with value, but do you have any comment about the outcome of what they're suggesting versus the outcome of what we're suggesting? I do. Uh... Strangely enough, I went off and actually took a look at it. So um, here is, is the uh, all value portfolio comparisons. On the left, we have two all values plus the small cap value. The top row across is what the questioner was talking about. One third US uh, large, one third uh, US small, uh, one sixth international large cap value, one sixth international small cap value. That's the one third international. And so on the right, the 100% stock portfolio generated a 12.3% uh, compound rate of return over the period, uh, 50 year period from 1970 to 2019. The one we use is one quarter spread across those four asset classes and it's 12 and a half. Uh, so they're about the same. Uh, small cap value, all small cap value is, of course, a little bit higher at 13.7 based on past history. So that's that's where we are. So it, is that just a random event difference, do you think, that two-tenths of one percent or whatever it was between the the proposed portfolio versus the portfolio that's on our website? It's certainly not enough that I would hang anything on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. it's there. 
I don't think you can't use that return alone, in my opinion, to make a decision which one to invest in. Yeah. And by the way, uh, a two fund strategy would be small cap value and large cap value, which is not there, but uh, that might even be a little better than the worldwide uh, strategy, but with less diversification. Great. Thank you. Um, number nine, uh, is there any magic in the way that you have built up the 10 and four fund strategies? Well, I get to take that one because I was there when they, when at least the 10 fund strategy was, was created. Basically what we did was we knew that we had 10 mutual funds that, or I should say 10 asset classes that represented asset classes with a long history of success from large US blend to international large blend and small cap in both places and small cap value both places. So there was, oh, and then there was emerging markets, and there were REITs, and we knew that we wanted to have 10% each. We weren't going to favor one over the other. We knew based on history that if we put all the money in small cap value, we'd make more than if we spread it across, at least looking backwards, all 10 of these asset classes. So what we wanted to find, and we did not create this idea, this came out of DFA, was a way to show people easily what happens if you just take a baby step. So we started out with 100% in the S&P 500. That is the asset class that most of us know. Then we added 10% in large cap value, which was the closest thing to the S&P 500. And then we went to small cap blend and small cap value. So every step along the way was kind of the way an investor might build a portfolio if they had this list of asset classes in front of them, which ends with the internationals coming later and the emerging markets way off at the, at the far right end. So it was not put together with any master plan so much as to say, look, let's just take these asset classes and one at a time add them to the portfolio. And, and Daryl, you put together the four fund strategy. Uh, there was no special approach to, to deciding when to add each strategy. It just came in with, as you would kind of normally think about it. U.S. large, large value, U.S. small, small value. Was there anything more creative than that? No, no special sauce. Yeah. Right. And I actually don't, it's not going to change, by the way, the end result no. if you mix and match. Because when you talk, about uh, a lump sum investment, uh, no money added, no money taken out. It, it doesn't matter when the, when the returns come, good times or bad times, in the early part, at the end of the time, the, the end result is going to be the same. So, uh, so there was no particular master plan. Uh, certainly no magic, we have no magic. Number 10, uh, any studies on withdrawing a higher rate than a safe 4% to delay drawing Social Security so your annual Social Security income is greater? I guess, I guess what this person is asking is, is there a way to customize how you use uh, all that information uh, about distributions. And Daryl, I'm not going to be shocked to find out that you have something you want to show us, but do you have any comment about uh, about how to address that using the tables that we have? Uh, using the tables that we have? No, not really. I don't, I don't think of it that way. Okay. Um, it turns out that this strategy is, is something that has been talked about in the past. Um, and, and I, I, strangely enough, I took a look at it 
before this, did a little pre-work and have some some things to share here if I can get to it. There. Is that up? There we go. Okie doke. Good. So um so if we if we look at someone who take who's normal normal retirement date at age sixty six, let's say, uh, is fifteen hundred dollars a month. That's eighteen thousand dollars a year. If they decide to take it at sixty two, it's thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. So, at age sixty two, they get thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. They take four percent out of a million dollar portfolio. That's forty thousand dollars. They have fifty three thousand five hundred dollars of what I call cash flow income here. Uh, that goes on for every year. These are const these are real dollars, constant dollars. Uh, so that inflation is is taken out of the equation here. It's it's like everything grows at the rate of inflation. So what happens if we wait until 70 to do this? How do we how do we do that? Well, the way we can do that is we we invent another little bucket here called the Social Security de Delay Withdrawal. And we make that $23,750. That was what, $760. That's what you would have ended up with had you waited until 70. So you start out taking that out of a kitty that you decided to call the Social Security, Social Security delay bucket here. And so every year you take out 23,760, you withdraw 4% out of the remaining portfolio, and that gives you a 56,157 income. So the, the Social Security delay bucket is eight times your, your age 70 uh, benefit. And then that comes off of the million dollars you had. So your, your portfolio bucket is down to a little over $800,000 now. And you take 4% of that, and that gives you the 32397 You add those two together, you get 56157 And each year, you take another $23,670 uh, in, in uh, real dollars out of the, the delay bucket. So the delay bucket's going down over time. Um, then it gets to zero at age 70 when you take Social Security and that's a 23,760 and that adds in and that gives you the same number, uh, 56,157 every year. So if you do this, you end up with, <coughs> excuse me, you end up with about, what is that, almost 30, almost $3,000 a year or more. Uh, and, so, and so that's one way to do it. Um, it works, this is with real dollars, it works with Nominal dollars also, I, this table here assumes 3% inflation. It works the same way. Um, the real problem with this comes about because you don't really know what inflation is going to be. So trying to size your, your Social Security delay bucket in advance gets a little bit more complicated. Um, doing this, by the way, is somewhat controversial because there, there were people who will say that, well, you can't guarantee you're going to live long enough to do that. And that's true. You can't. Um, and, and the, it also, in, the, in a lot of people's opinion, doesn't meet uh, or satisfy the break, their break-even analysis. And if that's the way you choose to look at Social Security, it probably doesn't if you die young, especially if you die young. Um, on the other hand, if you look at it more as a longevity insurance, uh, from a longevity insurance basis, um, it does provide you more, more income later on. Uh, portfolio still runs out at the same time here after whatever this is here, 25, 26 years in either case uh, here. So this is the, that the inflation and all your investment or your, all your investments only grow at the rate of inflation. So they probably grow at a better rate than that. And so your returns will actually be better than this and the portfolio will last longer than this. Another criticism of this is it's also a, a it's a lot like a bucket accounting system. And, and some people think bucket accounting is, is, a, uh, is a mental accounting uh, crutch, if you will. Uh, it's a behavioral tool. And you, if you choose to think of it that way, you can think of it that way. I don't necessarily think that there's anything wrong with that. It's you still manage it as one, one bucket. Uh, the social security delay bucket should be in fairly uh, safe, um, nominal return and or or uh what am i trying to say uh a more more r a lower risk i guess is the way i would 
uh, describe it, investments. So, because you need that to get through the, the first eight years. Um, I guess the final thing I would say on this is there is a thread on, on bogleheads.org called Delay Social Security to Age Six, Age 70 and Spend More Money at 62. Uh, it's a long thread. There are hundreds of posts in it, if I recall. And uh, it gets, it's a bogleheads thread. So sometimes it gets pretty contentious uh, and everybody has an opinion. So uh, if you read it, you, you need to keep that in mind when you read it. But it is an interesting concept. Daryl, could you uh, send me a, a link to that uh, that thread and yes. and uh, we'll we'll put it along with the uh, notes to the to the uh, podcast. All right, uh, let's see. Um, number eleven. Uh, what asset classes do you recommend for the bond portion of your portfolio, uh, Daryl? In building the tables, let's just talk about how the tables are built. Uh, you want to briefly go over those percentages? Yes, I can do that. So when we construct the fine tuning tables, there's an implicit fixed income portfolio that's part of the asset allocation mix. And that particular part of the portfolio is made up of three different types of fixed income investments. Uh, intermediate term or five year government treasuries, uh, short term or one to three year government treasuries and tips. The intermediate term treasuries are 50%, the short term uh, treasuries are 30% and the tips are 20%. And that's what the fixed income portfolio or fixed income part of the fine tuning tables uh, consists of. So, so I, for my background, where, where this came to me was from the research department, departments at my old firm, Ameriman Wealth Management and uh, people at Dimensional Funds. Uh, you've been following these strategies for decades yourself. Um, is there anything about that combination? It's a very low risk strategy. Uh, it isn't built to try to make a, more interest. It's built to try to be more stable and particularly we want stability during the most catastrophic markets, which governments tend to give us. You're not going to get the huge moves like you do with long-term governments when things are favorable for bonds, but you're also not going to have the huge declines that you get with long-term governments when we get a spike in, in, in interest rates. With all of the study that you personally did, was there anything about this strategy that you wish that we would consider changing? Well, I have not spent a lot of time, a whole lot of time looking at the bond side of the portfolio. We should probably do that. Um, but by the same token, I've always thought of the fixed income side of the portfolio as, as a rock of stability. That's to me, that's why it's there. Um, and I'm, I don't remember who said it, but I'm sure a lot of people have said it is you take your risk on the equity side. That's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I, I don't particularly have any, any qualms about the bond portfolio, the way you've constructed it for your ultimate buy and hold, uh, strategy or fixed or fine tuning, fine tuning tables. We do have, uh, a different set of bonds for people who are looking to maximize their monthly income without getting ag aggressive. And uh, we will include a link uh, to that uh, set of, of Vanguard funds. You could replicate it at, at Fidelity or most any other major uh, mutual fund company. Uh, but it is going to be uh, do less well you know, when, when we are in catastrophic times, uh, but give more income uh, during the periods that are more normal. So, uh, and Chris, would you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I, I think that was good. Okay. Okay. Uh, number 12, with bond returns so low, has that altered your thinking on the percentage of the portfolio devoted to bonds? 
Anybody want to take that? I'm, I'm happy I, to. I, Go yeah, ahead. No, I'll, I'll just chime in on that one. And I think uh, it, it touches a little bit on the purpose of bonds in the portfolio, right? So uh, Daryl just said they're there for safety, they're ballast. So, um, you know, the, if, if the reason the bonds are in your portfolio is for returns, you'd be very frustrated by the current environment. Um, I, a period of high inflation would make you even more frustrated because you could lose money, right? The bonds could go down. Um, and uh, they do uh, actually bear some risk in periods of high inflation. But I, I think the real reason they're there is they're a way for us to uh, soften the ups and downs of the market. And so the reason you're picking them isn't to raise your return. The reason you're picking them is that they have a history of some expected return, but lower volatility. And so as a diversifier in the portfolio, they're going to smooth things out. So the fact that the returns, the expected returns are lower right now, probably means they're also potentially a little bit less volatile, um, which means they might do a better job of, of that smoothing function. Um, I think the fine tuning tables that Daryl's put together are still a great way for somebody to pick a behaviorally driven mm -hmm. allocation, one they can live with and stick with and sleep with, right? And the fact that the returns are, are relatively low by historical standards right now doesn't change their ability to mitigate those ups and downs. And so I think they're still serving the primary purpose they're there for, and I, I'd use the fine tuning tables, yeah. Terrific. You know what, gentlemen, I came into this meeting thinking we might get to many more questions than we did. And we talked about trying to hurry the process a little bit so we could address more questions. But I think it's better that we gave it the time that we did and that we covered fewer questions because guess what? We will be back <laughs> another day and uh and i really appreciate uh what what you two are doing to uh expand uh, access to smart investing and great problem solving and i i really do thank you both very very much and we're going to be back uh, hopefully i don't know if we've got this plan for two weeks from now we'll wait and see because you've got your own personal schedules these two gentlemen donate their time to this organization and I really do appreciate it and uh, uh, you can send the emails in please questions for the future we don't get to them all but we get to as many as we can and thanks to AAII who uh, had us uh, in San Diego uh, they also had us in Silicon Valley we we're really pleased uh, to be able to uh, uh, to present and I just heard in the last few days that uh, uh, we're going to make a presentation uh, in uh, September. I think it's September 23rd that uh, I'll be making a presentation. And uh, Chris, I think you'll be making a presentation later. And um, Daryl, are you ready to make a presentation to AAII? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on something, but we'll see, you know, it's, okay. research. it's research. So you never know what you're going to find. You may find out that you're wrong, in which case then I wouldn't. Oh, all right. Well, we'll wait for the vaccine to be developed. Thank, <laughs> th thank you both very much. Good luck to all of you.